Welcome back to Surgery Sessions. Today, we're continuing with the remaining portion of the thyroid chapter. So let's move on to anatomy. The normal thyroid gland is reddish brown in color and rubbery in texture, with an adult gland typically weighing about 20 grams. The thyroid gland typically is situated behind the sternohyoid and sternothyroid strap muscles and the superficial and middle layers of the deep cervical fascia. When viewed in the anterior-posterior plane, the shape of the thyroid resembles the silhouette of a butterfly, with two lateral lobes connected by an isthmus draped over the upper trachea just caudal to the cricoid cartilage. A normal-sized thyroid lobe is typically 4 to 6 cm in height and 1.3 to 1.8 cm in both transverse and anterior-posterior dimensions. The isthmus typically has a thickness of 2 to 3 mm. In half to 3 quarters of people, a pyramidal lobe extends superiorly from the isthmus and represents the caudal remnant of the thyroid muscle duct. The right and left thyroid lobes make up the majority of the gland's volume. Each lobe's height extends from the mid to upper aspect of the thyroid cartilage down to the fifth to sixth tracheal rings. Laterally, the lobe extends to the sternocleidomastoid muscle and carotid artery with a small posterior lateral projection or lump known as the tubercle of Zuckerkander. The capsule enveloping the thyroid also forms separate pseudolobules within the parenchyma of the gland itself. These coalesce into a solid ligamentous structure at the posterior lateral aspect of the upper trachea called the suspensory ligament of Berry. The tubercle of Zuckerkandel and Berry ligament are relatively constant anatomic landmarks for identification of the distal recurrent laryngeal nerve, which typically runs just posterior to these structures. So this is quite important for us during the surgery. And moving on to the blood and lymphatic supply. The thyroid is a highly vascular gland with abundant and redundant blood supply. The arterial supply to the thyroid gland generally derives from two bilateral pairs of arteries. The superior thyroid artery originates from the external carotid arteries and divide as they enter the superior pole of the thyroid lobes. The inferior thyroid artery are the branches from the thyroid cervical trunks of the subclavian arteries. Because they branch fairly proximally from the thyroid cervical trunk, their course runs cephalid and posterior to the carotid sheath before making a turn and entering the mid-thyroid lobes. In about 2% of the people, a third artery called the thyroid ema artery arises directly from the aorta or the innominate artery. This artery follows a midline path and enters the thyroid isthmus or the inferior poles of the thyroid lobes. The direction of the inferior thyroid artery as it enters the thyroid gland is another important landmark used for the identity identification of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which typically crosses the artery perpendicular as it travels into the larynx. Branches of the inferior and superior arteries also supply the parathyroid glands. It is traditionally thought that the inferior thyroid arteries supply both superior and inferior parathyroid glands, but there can be significant anatomic variations around the arterial supply to the superior gland, which can be supplied by the inferior thyroid artery alone, the superior thyroid artery alone, or both. So there are three main venous drainage pathways from the thyroid gland. The superior thyroid veins typically run parallel to the superior thyroid artery and drain into the internal jugular veins. The inferior thyroid veins run in the caudal direction from the inferior poles of the thyroid lobes and drain into the innominate veins. The middle thyroid veins are highly variable but typically arise from the lateral aspect of the mid thyroid lobes. They drain into the internal jugular veins. Much like the blood supply, the lymphatic networks in and around the thyroid gland is rich and extensive. A proper understanding of the lymphatic system is of critical importance in the surgical management of diseases such as thyroid cancer. Lymphatic vessels course within the thyroid and drain into this regional cervical lymph node. There is a standardized method and nomenclature for organizing the cervical lymph nodes into seven discrete levels. An understanding of the pattern of lymphatic drainage from the thyroid is particularly important for understanding the surgical management of thyroid cancer. So we'll be discussing about the thyroid cancer in the further sections below. The bulk of lymphatic drainage from the thyroid first goes to the perithyroid lymph nodes in the central neck collectively grouped as the level 6, which includes the lymph nodes between the two carotid arteries and bounded by the hyoid bone superiorly and the sternal notch inferiorly. Lateral jugular lymph nodes 2a, 3 and 4, as well as those in the posterior triangle of the neck, particularly 5b, also drain lymphatics from the thyroid, typically in transit from the central neck lymph nodes. Skip metastasis that avoid level 6 and extend directly from primary tumor, typically in the superior pole of the thyroid to the lateral neck are exceptional cases that occur in less than 15% of the cases. Other levels of the neck are rarely associated with regional thyroid cancer metastasis. So after the anatomy, blood supply, and lymphatic supply, we'll be discussing about the nerves that are associated with the thyroid gland, which are very important for us during the surgery. So the thyroid is directly supplied by a network of tiny automatic nerves arising from the superior and middle cervical sympathetic ganglia and parasympathetic fibers derived from the vagus nerve. The two most important nerves associated with the thyroid gland for the surgeon are recurrent laryngeal nerve 
valve and the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. It is critical that the thyroid surgeon have a thorough understanding of the normal and analogous parts of these nerves such that these structures can be better preserved during thyroidectomy. The recurrent laryngeal nerve and the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve are the main nerves responsible for the function of the larynx. Each nerve is paired with the right and left side. The recurrent laryngeal nerve is by far the most important nerve and innovates the motor function of all of the intrinsic laryngeal muscles except for the cricothyroid. It carries sensory fibers from the lower larynx as well as minor motor and sensory fibers from the trachea and esophagus. So recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies all of the intrinsic muscles of the larynx except for the cricothyroid which is supplied by the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Unilateral injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve leads to the paralysis of the ipsilateral vocal cord with typical symptoms ranging from voice complaints such as hoarseness and vocal fatigue to aspiration. Bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve with subsequent bilateral vocal fold paralysis may require tracheostomy for airway control if the paralyzed vocal folds rest in the median position preventing adequate air exchange. Alternatively, the risk of persistent aspiration and respiratory tract infections is high if the resting vocal folds remain in an abducted position. The external branch of superior laryngeal nerve innervates the cricothyroid muscles and it contributes to vocal fold tone and tension. The external branch of superior laryngeal nerve injury leads to difficulties with achieving high pitch and vocal projection and volume. The nerve became a historical focus of attention after the famous opera singer Emilia Gala Cruci developed difficulty singing high notes after thyroidectomy. This was thought to be due to its injury during surgery, although subsequent historic reports dispute this claim. The anatomy of the left and right recurrent laryngeal nerve differs based on the embryological development. Both recurrent laryngeal nerves are derived from the sixth branchial arc below the sixth aortic arc. As the 5th and 6th aortic arches above the recurrent laryngeal nerve subsequently regress in embryogenesis, the true nerves then anchor to and follow the right and left 4th aortic arch structures which develop into differing arteries, the right subclavian artery and the aortic arch respectively. Both nerves loop back or recur into the neck due to the heart and great vessels descending into the thorax, bringing the recurrent laryngeal nerve down with them. The left recurrent laryngeal nerve loops under the ligamentum arteriosum at the aortic arch and travels in the tracheocephagial groove until it which is the thyroid. The right recurrent laryngeal nerve loops under the right carotid subclavian artery junction and migrates to the cricothyroid joint at the insert and into the larynx. Because of the lateral location of right carotid subclavian junction and the shorter length of the course of the right recurrent laryngeal nerve, this nerve can be identified traveling in a slightly interior plane and an oblique direction compared to the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, which tends to stay relatively deep and straight into the tracheocephagial groove. There are a number of anatomic landmarks that can aid in the identification characterization of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The tubercle of Zucker candle, which we have discussed previously in this video, typically lies just anterior and lateral to the nerve. There is an intimate relationship between the nerve, very ligament, and the inferior thyroid artery at the level of cricoid cartilage. So you must remember this. There is an intimate relationship between the nerve, which is the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the Barry's ligament, and the inferior thyroid artery at the level of cricoid cartilage. Here, the nerve crosses the artery, usually posterior, and typically curves anteriorly towards the ligament before diving posteriorly again into the laryngeal insertion point at the cricothyroid joint. There are numerous anatomic variations of the course of the nerve and its relationship with the three structures, particularly with respect to how anteriorly the nerve can be positioned. In addition, the recurrent laryngeal nerve may branch more proximally in up to 20-30% of the cases, and preservation of all of the branches is important to preserve nerve function. This is particularly true for the anterior branches, which predominantly provide motor innovation. The recurrent laryngeal nerve also may course in a non-recurrent fashion instead branching in a direct path from the cervical vagus. On the right side, this is associated with and likely secondary to an aberrant right subclavian artery arising directly from the aortic arc instead of the innominate artery called the lysuria artery. This artery arises distal to the left subclavian artery and crosses the midline posterior to the esophagus. Because of the absence of a normal right subclavian carotid junction to pull down the right recurrent laryngeal nerve during embryological development, the right recurrent laryngeal nerve follows a straight path from the vagus to the larynx. A right-sided non-recurrent laryngeal nerve occur in up to 1% of the people. A left-sided non-recurrent nerve can occur in extremely rare scenarios of the patient with situs inversus and a right-sided aortic arc. Like the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the superior laryngeal nerve arises from the vagus nerve. The external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve branches off at the hyoid bone and runs along the inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscle before running parallel to the upper aspect of the superior porphyroid vessels and then terminating in the cricothyroid muscle. Although the external branch of superior laryngeal nerve is typically fairly high above the thyroid lobe, care must be taken when ligating and dividing the superior pole vessel during thyroidectomy. As the anatomic 
variations in the external branch of a superior nitrogen lock can run quite close to the vessel and the upper thyroid lobe and must be dissected away as the superior pole of the thyroid gland is taken down. Go on to the histology. The thyroid is comprised mainly of two epithelial cell types. The first and predominant type is the follicular cell, which is responsible for the production and secretion of thyroid hormones. The second type is the parafollicular C cells, which secretes calcitonin. The histologic architecture of the thyroid is arranged into spherical follicles containing colloid. Colloid is made up of thyroglobulin, which is the non-iodinated precursor of active thyroid hormone and acts as a reservoir. The parafollicular C cells are located within the interfollicular stroma and are mainly found in the lateral aspect of the mid and upper thyroid lobes. 